morning again. Let's all open now and turn our Bibles to the book of Colossians. Today we're looking at Colossians chapter 1, and we will be reading from verses 15 through verse 20. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. When you found it, let us rise in reverence for God and his holy word. This is the reading of the word of God. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This is the word of God. May God bless you with his word. Do you look like one of your parents? Growing up, I was always told I looked like my mom and my brother would look like our dad. And I think that's changed over the years. I think as I've grown up, I now look more and more like my father. My, my jaw filled out. I have more of a squarish looking jaw. And my mom does not have a square jaw, but my dad does. My hair is getting whiter and whiter. The first thing that Elder Jonathan said when he saw me today is, oh, you have so much white hair. <laughs> and just like my father, he, you know, he, he started to go gray at, a, at an uh, earlier age, uh, around the same time as I am. And if I look at my brother, yeah, the same thing. It's even like in the same places, like where my hair is changing and turning white, it's just like my brother's. So I kind of know, like two years from now, if I want to know what my hair will look like, I just look at my brother. That's kind of what it seems. But is that the case for you? Do you look like one of your parents or maybe one of your grandparents? It's an interesting thing when a child looks like their parents. But here in this passage, we have something that is very, very different from what we probably have imagined. Because many of you would have known, if you read through the Bible, you would probably have thought of this a lot, that we are all made in the image of God. You and I, all of us, Every single person in this world is made in the image of God. Now, what that's supposed to tell us then is that we're supposed to somehow look like God. But how does that work? Well, today, we have an even deeper mystery, something that I'm still mulling over and thinking through. And I, I, and I don't think I fully gotten as far as I'd like, uh, but you know, I'd like to share with you some of the things that have come up. Because what it talks about here is not that you and I, mankind, are made in the image of God, but it talks about Jesus Christ, that he is the image of God. It says here, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. 
And that is something that is very different from us being made in the image of God. And yet at the same time, there's much that we could learn from. That our being made in the image of God is very different, but yet at the same time, it's supposed to be similar. And so one way I can describe it is this. When it says here, when Paul writes to the Colossians, uh, the people in, Colos in Colossae, in saying that Jesus is the image of God, what this tells us is that Jesus is truly divine. That Jesus is very God. And when we say we are made in the image of God, that's when we sh should understand what it means to be truly human. And when Jesus here is the image of God, we see that this is in relation to his Father, to God in three persons, that he is the image of the invisible God. And that sounds like an oxymoron. How can something invisible have an image? It's like a ghost that stands in front of a mirror. You ever see cartoons of a ghost standing in front of a mirror? There's nothing. What is the image of the invisible God? Well, the reason why it's difficult for us to understand is not because it is a contradiction, but the problem is that it's so great, so vast, that it is impossible for us to fully understand, but yet we can understand in a real way, in a true way. And that's one of the goals that we have for today. Because, you see, to understand the image of God, to understand that Jesus Christ is the image of God, is critical, I believe, to understanding what sanctification is all about. To understand that Jesus is the image of God is critical for us to understand what glorification will be. Now, what do I mean by that? In that day when Jesus Christ comes back and he raises everyone from the dead, and those who are alive will be raised to the resurrection body and have eternal life? Well, if you were to ask me in a simple way, what does that look like? What does that mean? The best answer I can give to you, the simplest answer I can give to you is in that day, in the resurrection, you know what you will see? The image of God. And then what is our life of holiness supposed to all be about? Our life of growing as a Christian, what is that supposed to look like? Well, very simply, it's supposed to look more like Jesus. Every day we're supposed to look a little bit more like Jesus. Well, what does that look like? The image of God. And so this is where our study and understanding of God, the theology that we would have, our knowledge of God, and our understanding of the knowledge of man, what we would describe as anthropology, where the two are the closest. That's where I would describe it. And that's why, you know, this... This passage and the topic today might be a little bit difficult, but I will hopefully make it as simple as I can. When Paul writes that Jesus is the image of God, one of the things that we see is that it is in relation to the rest of creation. 
he is imaging this not just to himself, right? Jesus is not just like a mirror where the father looks at Jesus and he sees himself. That's not supposed to be the point here. The point of what Paul is bringing up is that this image is reflected throughout all of creation. He is the image of the invisible God, not to himself because he's visible to himself in in that mysterious way, but to the rest of creation to whom God is invisible. And the way that Paul describes it is that he says that he is the firstborn of all creation. Now, don't get confused in thinking that Jesus had to be born. Not in that way. But when we think about Jesus here as the firstborn of all creation, we are talking about his authority. We are talking about his uh, what we would describe as his preeminence, his status. And why would we know this? Well, because he uses this same language later in this exact same parallel part of this passage. He is also, in verse 18, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn of creation, verse 15, And also in verse 18, firstborn from the dead. So when Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, it's not talking about a literal birth. It's not talking about him being dead, going back into Mary's womb and being born again. That was the mistake of Nicodemus. But it is being born again into new life, born from above, born through the Holy Spirit. And so when Paul is using the language of firstborn here, he's talking about Jesus as his authority as the Son. He's talking about Jesus as the Son of God. And that Jesus... He is distinct from the Father because he's an image, but he is distinct from all creation because he is the Lord. And what does that mean? In verse uh, 16, Paul continues, For by him all things were created, which means himself excluded. Jesus was not made, Jesus was not born, but he is always the son. And when he made all things, he made literally everything. Everything was made by Jesus. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities All things were created through him and for him. Now, when we see this language of thrones or dominions or rulers and authorities, this reminds us again of the first creation account in Genesis chapter 1. This reminds us when God gives authority and dominion to different spheres in his creation, but specifically He gives dominion to humankind. He gives the man and the women dominion over the creatures. And this gives us an idea of what it means to be made in the image of God. Why? Jesus is before all creation, and he's the image of God. And all things were made for him, through him, to him. Mankind, they were made at the end. They were the last part of creation. And that included is also for him, through him, 
to him. That all of mankind in the dominion that they were given was all part of what Jesus had made. And mankind was made along with all of the creatures, and yet it was distinct. Mankind, as male and female, Adam and Eve, as God had created them, they were part of the creation, but because they bore the image of God, and whatever that means, it showed that they were different. They were different from the rest of creation, just as much as Christ, the image of God, was different from the rest of creation. And that all of creation was supposed to have been under the dominion of God's made image, God's created image in Adam and Eve. How much more should that have been true of the true image? He's not the made image, but he is the very image of God. And so we see parallels where Jesus is related to his Father and related to the creation, and yet he is above all things. This helps us to understand how Adam and Eve were to function in the world. They were related to their God, but they were different from the rest of creation. And that Adam could name all the animals, but realized there was no one who was an equal, no one who was someone suitable to be his helper. And Adam was alone until he had Eve. Another thing we can see here is this image is seen clearer in other parts of Paul's writing. And some of the things that we could find is uh, we need to t turn, and not just in Paul's writing, but also in the book of Hebrews. So let's turn first to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. And this is where we will see in, in one part of how Jesus is the image of God. Now, he's talking about people who are abusing the gospel, and the gospel is veiled to them. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, it reads, And even if our gospel is veiled, covered, not visible, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Now, one of the things that I want us to pay attention to here is that there is connected to this idea of the image of God with the glory of God. The image of God is revealed in Jesus Christ in such a way that the glory of God is being revealed. And this is helpful, to, helpful for us to understand when Paul is saying that the invisible God is visible. The glory of God is being revealed. Verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Looking into the face of Jesus Christ will make the glory of God appear in your sight. And this is the mystery of Jesus Christ as being the image of God. It is the mystery of the incarnation, which will be revealed in the resurrection. 
Turn now to Hebrews chapter 1. In Hebrews chapter 1, it speaks of something very similar, even though it does not use the exact language that we are talking about. But in Hebrews chapter 1, it tells us in verse 3, He, that is Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. This is the language that we would understand of what it means to be the image of God. It's the imprint. It's like you had a piece of clay and you put your hand on it, your finger on it, your foot on it, and you leave an imprint. You leave a mark. It's the image. You ever take Play-Doh and you put a coin in it and you take it out and you see what? The image of the coin. Jesus is described as the exact imprint of God's nature. And in this same verse, we see that the language is that he upholds the universe by the word of his power. The themes are all related. It's pointing to the fact that Jesus is the creator, that he is the one who is filled with glory. So then, to understand and to know Jesus Christ is to know the glory of God. This is so important for us to understand now that when Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 that we have fallen short of the glory of God, we should see this in the light of Jesus' face. That when all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, we have fallen short of what it had meant to be made in the image of God. When all we were made for in everything in our life and our purpose was meant to glorify God. When all that we were designed to do was to honor God as God, recognizing Christ as Lord and Creator, we had fallen short of that glory. Or in other words, we had fallen very far from Christ and his glory. That's what we can understand if we now see from the end and look towards the beginning because Christ is the creator. He is the image of God. So what does God do? when the image is broken. You see, the image of God was not lost in the sense where we, as sinners, had somehow lost the image of God. Not exactly, because the image of God seems to have been retained, but it was broken. It's like a mirror. This is the simplest illustration I can think of, and I think I shared this before, but it's the best one I can come up with. It's like a mirror. You ever break a mirror? Does a mirror stop working? It still reflects. It still shows the image. It's just broken into tiny little pieces. And the image that's supposed to have been clear in that one big mirror, in all the pieces that are shattered in that mirror, You just see little traces of that image in all the little specks. And that's kind of like what it is when we sin. The image of God, which it should be grand and great and clear, is clouded and small and indistinguishable. The image of God, which is supposed to have been made visible through us, 
that we as his image bearers were supposed to bring the knowledge of God, the glory of God everywhere has now become indistinguishable and distorted. It's like a clown mirror. Instead of glorifying the image, it is a, a joke. Instead of looking at the image and you see the splendor of God and his glory, we became like a carnival mirror where you look at the image and you laugh. That is what sin had done. And so Jesus becomes man. The image of God. He is the image of God. Somehow would be able to become man. And this is part of the reason why many theologians think that it was actually possible the fact that we were first created in this image. But it's not just the fact that he had to be made into the image of like us and take on our nature and to be uh, created. That the, as the true image of God, he had to bear this made image. It, it's worse. You see, when Christ had to come, he wasn't just in our likeness, but he had to bear our likeness in sin, in sinful flesh. And in bearing our likeness, he had to be condemned. This is exactly what Paul writes in Romans 8 in the very passage that I was reading to us. In Romans chapter 8, verse Three, God has done, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin. And he condemned sin in the flesh. Christ, the image of God, the visible God of the visible, invisible God, the one who shines the glory, had to be made like us in bearing sinful flesh, in bearing our likeness and being cursed and crucified. This is what Jesus Christ had to do. This was how far he was willing to go. So that he could change us, transform us back into the image. He is reversing the curse of sin. He is reversing the brokenness of that image. But what he's doing is not going backwards. He's not taking us backwards to Adam, to being made as just simply the image of God. But now he is transforming this image. This is what he's doing. In, this is where Paul writes, he is the firstborn from the dead in that everything he might be preeminent. This is where he's doing it so that we could be called the children of God, so that we could be adopted as the children of God. And he's doing this to make peace by the blood of his cross. Romans chapter 8. Again, Paul continues with this image language. Verse 28. We know that for those who love God, 
All things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You are going to be conformed now to the image of Christ. And when you do, the purpose is so that in order that he might be the firstborn, the same language as we see of the firstborn from the dead. This being the firstborn is so that you could be true children of God, that you could be adopted as true children. Now, of course, we will not become the true image like Christ is the image in the sense that we will become divine or somehow we will have this transformation from human to God, human to divine. No. But we will be transformed from a created son to an adopted son. This image will show our true status as the children of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 48. This is to show that we're not going back to the image of Adam. We are going to the image of Christ. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is the culmination of salvation. That in the resurrection, when Jesus Christ brings the kingdom of God on earth, you will shine as lights. Why? Because the glory of God will be revealed. Why? Because you will be transformed into the image of of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord. Again, this language of Jesus is the glory of the Lord. And when we look at Jesus, we are seeing the glory of the Lord. We are being transformed into the same image. We are being transformed no longer as the image of the man of dust. We are being transformed into the image of the man of heaven. And we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. And we know that this is clear, that this is talking about the image of Christ, because we saw earlier that this is the very image that we saw in verses 4 through 6 of chapter 4. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. What does this mean then? It's very simple, but very deep. Do you want to be transformed as a Christian? Do you want to be a good Christian? Just look into Jesus' face. You look into his face and you will be made more and more like him. That is how 
salvation is applied. That is how your justification is being applied in sanctification. It is being transformed not into the image of the man of dust, not into the image of the law, but you are being transformed into the image of Christ himself. Yes, in one degree, the man of dust pointed to Christ. Yes, in one degree, the law points us to Christ. But you will be transformed to that unadulterated, pure image of Christ himself. This is how you grow. Well, how? How do you do that? How do you look at Jesus when he's not here? How do you see him when you can only see by faith? When Jesus, the one who makes the invisible God visible, how do you do that? Paul says, you look in the light of the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 again. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel. The light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And I think to some degree, this is what it meant when mankind had fallen short of the glory of God. They failed to keep and fix their eyes on the glory of God. They failed to keep their eyes fixed on the glory of God, and the glory of God now was still the glory of God then, which was revealed in the face of Jesus Christ. And so to no longer fall short of this glory means then you will fix your eyes on Jesus in his gospel. In his gospel is clear the fullness of the love of God. In his gospel it is clear the night light of the glory of God. Do you want to see the glory of God? For now, you must look by faith, but you look to the gospel. And when you do, that's when you see the shining face of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is made clear to the degree that we will look much uh, more later as we look through this book where Paul tells us that this is now what will happen in the whole process of changing and putting off what was dead, putting off which was sin, putting off the old likeness. You put on the likeness of Christ. You put on the likeness of God. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self, the old self that Christ had to bear that sinful image. Be crucified. You put that off with its practices. And you put on the new self, which is to put on Christ, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. If you want to understand how to live as a Christian, the simple phrase I would tell to you is live out the image of God in your life. That is what you are supposed to be. That is what you are supposed to become. That was what you were actually designed to do. What good is a car that cannot drive, or a pen that doesn't write, or a knife that doesn't cut? 
What good is a person who is made in the image of God and does not reflect the glory of God? No, now, all of life, all of life means that now you are a slave to Christ, that you now serve Him because you recognize that in Him, He is preeminent that he is the creator of all things and all things were designed for him. And now he is the head of the church. And he is the head of the church in a way that I think is uh, pointing us back as Adam had taken a wife, Eve, and the two had become one. Christ has taken on his bride. And this too is how we will be made into the image of Christ. Ephesians chapter 5. He will sanctify you, wash you to be made a beautiful bride, shining in glory. This too points us to the image of God. So now, everything, everything is to the glory of God. Why? Because Jesus is the fullness of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. We see this parallel when we see in the first half where Jesus is the image of God as the creator of all things. Everything was made for him. It was for him, his purpose through him. But now in here, in verse, the second half, where Jesus is the fullness, he's the firstborn of the dead, from the dead, verse 19, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to rec reconcile to himself all things. This means that as Christians, you live for the gospel. Your politics will be driven by the gospel. Your view of socialism or social change, your view of education, your view of your job, your career, your view of family, your view of joy, vacation, anything will now be lived in such a way where Christ is preeminent, where all things will be lived to the glory of God. And you do this because you live the gospel, the gospel which contains the knowledge of Christ. That everything that you would say, everything that you would do, would be to bring his banner to bring the knowledge of him to those who are lost. So that every thought, every heart would be brought captive to Christ. That every tongue and every knee would bow to the Lord Christ. It means that Jesus is Lord of all. That is why you live. And that's how you will live in this earth as his image. Let us pray.